Hey everybody, I'm Matt and welcome to Nected. Today, Drew will be interviewing Rob Dickinson. To give you an idea, Rob worked on more than 11 startups, being now CEO of his 12th, Resurface Labs. We are going to go through his methods, the reasoning behind Resurface Labs, and at the end, you're going to hear some very peculiar advice on being an entrepreneur. I'll be leaving you here and have a good listening. Uh, hello, everyone. Today we have Rob Dickinson from Colorado, who is the founder and creator of Resurface Labs. Uh, Rob, can you briefly introduce yourself to the audience and thank you, <laughs> maybe share what <laughs> Resurface Lab is and what you are trying to solve and build here? Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. So <clears throat> Resurface is a company in Boulder, Colorado. We're a, we're a startup that started actually here in my basement. Um, where I am right now, we're building uh, what we call a system of record for API calls. And so what that means is that we're creating a database that is able to log your API calls um, that you're making as part of your digital business so that you actually have a record of the transactions that you're conducting through your APIs. Think about it this way. Um, so, so the web that we built, you know, in the nineties and the early two thousands, that was a web for humans. And so it's, there's this big emphasis on HTML content, PDF content. Um, you see, you see a lot of municipalities, healthcare companies, you know, making, uh, customer portals and, and giving out information through those web based formats. But you fast forward to where we are now. And what we really want now is to be able to apply automation to all this data, as well as work with it as a human. So you look at, for example, um, some of the regs that have just come out of the, the Biden administration about having access to, to patient data, specifically be through APIs. And they even called out the case of like, just having a PDF on a website is not good enough, that patient data needs to be available for for automation um whether that's your own or you know someone else that you're contracting with but it's that access to digital information and those abilities to integrate and and use that data is is really what's really what's driving it so this api attack or hacking is this something that's common or that happens a lot i mean it's it's getting to crisis levels um honestly and i don't mean to you know inflame the situation but you you see this in the, in the news all the time like the peloton attack i mean the the supply chain attacks that are that are happening the the pipeline um ransomware attack in the southeastern us i mean all of these are examples of these digital properties are are being exploited these public digital properties are in, are running in a very very hostile environment and I mean, when I when I started building websites and web-based applications, I mean, you were always thinking about attacks. You were always thinking about kind of misuse of of your stuff. But it, but in practical reality, it was it was it was kind of rare, <laughs> and it really only happened to like the most popular sites. And like, but you fast forward to today, you know, fifty percent of your traffic may be bogus to malicious in nature, but not real transactions that that are really meaningful to your business. If you're a crypto processor, if you're a bank, you know, 90% of your incoming traffic may be, may be malicious. What we're trying to do is we're trying to help digital providers understand how their systems are being used and when they're when they're breaking. Um, being able to recover from those experiences when they're being misused or attacked, um, trying to be able to recover from those experiences. So I started this project originally as a side project. Um, well, I I had a startup in this area, um, and then when that, uh, which I can I can talk about, but when that when that kind of fell apart. Um, I, I ended up starting Resurface initially as a side project, and then we ended up raising capital and launching it as a, as a full-time business from there. 
No, I would I would actually love to hear that. So you said you started this from your garage and like, you know, you build it from scratch. Um, and I'm pretty sure this wasn't your first startup and you went, you know, you started something and failed. You, you start something else, you pivoted and then you finally got to where you are now. Um, but can you kind of share what your whole journey was? I mean, right now you have a product of a company, yep, you're getting customers, you know, people see you as, you know, a CEO, but I'm pretty sure um, in the past it was kind of, you know, there were hard periods. Uh, I would love to, you know, uh, hear about that. Well, it's, you know, a lot of this is hard. And, you know, if you're going to do, if you're going to do this kind of work, you, you have to fail a lot. You have to try a lot of things and you have to fail a lot. So I actually, my first couple startups, especially, were like, I don't care if this succeeds. I know I'm just going to learn a lot and I'm probably just going to walk away from it. And, you know, it's like, I was never thinking like, oh, I'll be able to retire early or like whatever, like so, some of the things that you can kind of fall into. It was more like, I'm going to make a bunch of mistakes when nobody's really watching and there's not really that much on the line. Um, so, you know, I mean, Resurface is like, it's like my 12th startup or something. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I've, you know, a lot of failure, right? You, there's a lot of learning experiences that go into that. But my last really significant startup, um, we started off here in, in Boulder County and we were, a, we were a system monitoring company. And what that really means is you're like monitoring the health of the machine. Like, is the code running, you know, is the machine up or down? Is the code running fast? Is the code running slow? And it's, and it's all about like, what is the machine doing? And um, we, we built this business up and we, we ended up selling it to, to Quest Software. Quest became Dell Software. We ended up becoming a, a magic quadrant, you know, leading solution um, in the system monitoring um, and web monitoring space around this. And the whole idea, um, which is actually still being sold today, but the whole idea behind that was that if your computers are okay and your computers are healthy, then your users are probably okay. And that's not like completely without merit. I mean, obviously if your systems are down or super slow, you know, your customers are going to be having a bad time. But as we started getting bigger and bigger customers, you know, we had Apple as a customer, Bank of America, United Airlines, I mean, some, some really big names. The, the more we started to see these cases where the systems were up, but what they were doing was wrong. Um, you're selling airline tickets for $5 that should have been $5,000 and you're losing tons of money. Um, or you're turning away business because you say you can't ship to a valid zip code. Um, uh, you're serving, you know, in a modern context, you've got an API and every once in a while, because of some stupid bug that somebody introduced late at night as they were trying to fix a bunch of other things, there's an extra comma in the JSON and it breaks the JSON parsers downstream. And it only happens like some percentage of the time. With our previous company, we built this up. We, we got this amazing set of customers around this idea that you really need to know what's happening, you know, it all the time. I mean, if you're Apple, you know, you, you can't afford any broken transactions, like everything, you, know, you, you want everything to work. You want everything to be the highest possible quality. Um, but fast forward to where we are now. I mean, everybody wants that level of care. Everybody wants that, that level of assurance because we were part of Dell even though we had this great base of customers, our customers started moving to the cloud in droves. And we wanted to follow them and really do a cloud native version of our solution. And Dell, you know, was just not interested in doing that. They're just not, you know, not to impugn anyone at Dell. It was a great company. I, you know, they treated me well when I was there. Um, but, um, but they're really not, you know, even, even today, like just not really a very cloud native, um, company. 
and so we we lost most of our customers around that um around that shift and it was just so incredibly painful because you take something from nothing to running in production at bank of america and you you and you feel like you've you've won like you you feel vindicated on some like incredible level and then ultimately it's taken away um and that just really gave me uh, a chip on my shoulder and so i felt like that that need was still there the market is still like it's it's even bigger today than 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 it was then and um but i i literally had to start over from nothing i mean when i left dell i had i didn't have a portfolio i mean like every every bit of code i'd written for the last 15 years was you know was was locked up and like literally like even when i was going out to interview it was like well i have like no public no public portfolio on github like i have like nothing to show and so i started resurface like originally that project that like i just i need something to show that i can what i'm capable of and and at the same time feeling like you know that market opportunity was still there and i just i just had to walk away from it and had it had a huge huge chip on my shoulder about it wow i mean so were you eventually um an employee and then decided that you wanted to be an entrepreneur and started your stuff or did you know that you wanted to build something you know you know from a really young age i i always wanted to i always wanted to start a company my degree was actually in electrical engineering but i put myself through school writing code on the side and by the time i graduated I mean, it was pretty obvious, like, I mean, I've never used my double E degree, like for anything, like, I, I maybe did a little bit when I was at Intel, like, maybe there's some things there that I could follow that I maybe wouldn't have been able to otherwise, but, <clears throat> but just, but just basically realize, like, well, I'll be able to make more money and have more fun writing code. And like, that was really the emerging, you know, tech at the time. I mean, I was, I was really there well timed to see the see the dot com you know bubble up close and you know and i was i was one of those you know dot com prospectors right getting paid in options and all the crazy stuff that was that was going on there i mean i was you know i was 25 and i had 17 people working for me um and had a multi million dollar budget like at at one of those companies um which you know you just you couldn't get that kind of experience going to HP or going to IBM or going to like some established um, tech company. Nobody's going to put you in charge of, you know, one of those companies, you know, in your early twenties. Um, but so anyway, so I've really, I've just, I've always sought out those kinds of experiences and roles where you can just really push yourself, learn new things, um, you know, I think in the end, you know, whether you're early on your career or later on in your career, you you can either choose to be comfortable or you can choose to grow and take on new things and adapt. And you really can't do both. Since you brought that up, another thing that I was um, curious about, when you look for a partner or find someone that you know you want to work with um what's your priority and you know what what's kind of a red flag that you have saying that oh if this person has this you know if you see this in this person you're not going to work with them right so what's your priority when you find a partner and what's kind of the red flag i would say for you yeah it's it's a really good it's a really good question um I mean, and of course, I think these kinds of things, like some of these can be specific to the kind of company or the kind of domain or 
So, you know, it, it, it maybe isn't a one size fits all, but, but I can say what, what we're trying to do and the way that we're thinking about this is it seems like you can hire around competence really specifically, or you can hire more around psychological profile um, and energy. And again, it's, it's kind of like, it's another way of saying kind of growth versus comfort in terms of a hiring plan. Um, we're really having a lot of success, I think, um, and kind of stole this idea from Mark Pincus, um, who literally used this phrase um, that, that they, they really tried to, to focus on hiring people with what they call broken resumes, which is you've got a great resume on paper, but you're missing experience or you're trying to shift from one thing to another or, but you're really intent on doing something amazing. You're intent on trying to recreate yourself, trying to get to that next level. Um, I mean, myself, I, I know it's like kind of pretentious thing to say, but I, I really want to think of myself as an artist and I want our, our team to think of ourselves that way because what that means is that you're constantly pushing the boundaries of what you're doing and you're constantly stepping back from what you're doing and and not wanting to get too boxed in by it um again it's kind of that growth versus comfort and and really having an environment um if you if you really want to push push that that creative limit um you have, I think you kind of have to get people that don't necessarily know exactly what they're doing, um, but are willing to take the risk. They're willing to risk their time, their energy, their, you know, to get good experience, to get, you know, to be part of something amazing. Um, my, I'd say my red flag um, is the folks who are um, kind of siloed and you'll kind of, and you'll kind of hear this. Um, I'm, and I'm not like anti-experience at all or anti-competency at all. But if in the first two sentences of meeting you, you're telling me like how many years of experience you have and like all of the great things that like that you can that you can do um that for me is a red flag um because the question should be like well who is it that you're going after what is it that you're trying to build what thesis is it that you're trying to follow like um and what's the what's the greatest expression of that that you could do right now in this market, in this economy, right now, this month, right now, literally. Um, that's, and I relate this to my own experience and my own history. Like, that's not what I did in my previous company. That's not what I did three years ago. That's not what I did six months ago. You know, that's literally like, what's, what are the opportunities available us to right now? And how can we most creatively fit that, fit that need? You know, thanks for bringing that up. I, I, I totally agree on what you're saying. The other thing that I kind of was curious since you brought this up is um, I noticed that it's really not that easy to find and communicate with people who have these similar mindsets. So I, I, I call them entrepreneurs, right? But um, it's different from when I talk with, you know, my colleagues at my company versus, you know, people like you or my co-founder or Justin, you know, people who are entrepreneurs so, so definitely there's two different types of people based on my experience and I was wondering how you meet these people that you you know get connected and work with well I'd, I'd say the the pandemic has certainly put like an odd an odd spin on this and um, I mean we <laughs> we've hired people over zoom that we actually have yet to still meet in person um, for one reason or another. Um, it's, it's been crazy. So I think, you know, I think what everybody does is 
first you you really start with your personal network and you you kind of go from there um you know like as far as you can take that right and the thing that's really amazing about that is one thing about almost every early stage person that i've met is co-founders you know other founders will go out of their way to help i mean even if they like honestly haven't met you before um i mean i've had emails that i've sent to other ceos that i've never met it's like hey man i'm having a serious problem like can you just help me out founder to founder like tell me what the hell is going on with this right and they like nine times out of 10, they'll respond, right? Um, because everybody who's been in this long enough, like you you know how arbitrary it is, right? I mean, it's like that expression, sometimes you get the bear and sometimes the bear gets you, right? It's, it's sometimes you're the one helping out and then a lot of times you're the one that needs help. So um, founders are really, you know, really amazing um, in almost every context um around that so you know having that having that kind of support network is is really important um you know at the end of the day you know your friends your family your spouse your neighbors even your coworkers, like they don't really understand what you're going through um and the the challenges and the the stress and the angst and the all the different scenarios that you have to be prepared to deal with that you know <laughs> you didn't really know about in a, you know in advance um and the the only people who really understand that are are other founders during the pandemic we really started to hire in some atypical ways and you know, data points are still limited, but actually hiring through Twitter has been like very successful um, for us. Like one of the things that we've done is we have a bunch of open source code. And so we're running a program where we're specifically going after younger engineers, you know, folks who are right out of college, um, but don't have a lot of professional experience yet. So really good skills and really just like looking for an opportunity to shine and we've got this program going where if you work on our open source stuff then we'll pay you a, a rate to do that um and you get the professional experience so again it's like we're helping you build your portfolio you're getting some bragging rights we're getting some some code out of the deal great um so i just have um like two more questions i wanted to ask you but i, I don't want to you know take too much of your time um but now as a ceo I, I could see how busy you might be but can you kind of share how your typical you know day looks like as a ceo and you know leading your company um th there's an easy answer for this um if if you're doing anything early stage you're in sales um whether you're writing code or not you're in sales um, whether you're working on financial models or whatever you're in sales, like the the, the best way to think at, at this stage is everybody helps sale, everybody helps selling. Um, founder led selling is a really important model um, to have. I think this is something that you can make make an easy mistake on um, is thinking of sales in terms of something that one part of your organization is going to figure out versus being the responsibility of, of everyone. One of the really, like, here's a really stupid hack for this that we did. Um, one of the things we did really early was um, everybody who joins our team, um, kind of regardless of your background or what your role is, you get a developer class laptop that's like really tricked out which means everybody could run the product, everybody can do a demo, everybody can be QA, you know, everybody has that immediate tactile access to our own technology. And then it also means you can get in front of a customer and you can do a demo. Um, and that's, that's, that's super important. 
the most important thing that you can do early stage is as much time as you can spend with your customers, the better. So the, the most feedback you can get, um, the most conversations you can get, and you really work, you know, you really work backwards from, from that. If you stay focused on that and you're really getting that feedback and you're building that engine for incorporating that feedback, um, I think that's how you really dial in on something that is, is the most, most vi vibrant and relevant at, at that point in time. There are no universal answers. I think it's one of the things that we've realized. Like um, being a parent is like this. Um, you, you become a parent, you get all this advice and wisdom about how to be a parent, but ultimately you have to do what's right for your kid. And you have to understand that mapping. And there's like no like best school as it turns out. Well, there's like the best school for your kid. Um, and it's that fit. And startups are just the same. And so at the end, there's, there's, you know, it's good to get all this feedback. It's good to share knowledge. It's good to hear about what people are doing in other domains and learn from those stories. But at the end of the day, it's really about your, your kid, your customer base that you're really trying to, to reach and doing what's right for them, even if that's the opposite of conventional wisdom, um, that's how you'll learn what rules you can break. I'm like here learning so much from what you're saying. Um, it just feels like you were on a lot of interviews or you had you know, a lot of experience, but um, you know, thank you for these, um, I would say wisdoms um, on what you say, they're, they're really valuable. Um, I think you just answered my last question, but we usually, uh, this is like a, a general question that we ask, but for now that you have so much experience, um, what would be the most important thing or what would you say to people who do not have much experience, who's just starting um, and they're you know grinding to get their company up and going, what would be the, the one, I mean, what would you say to the, or, or like mentor these young entrepreneurs? You know, you, you just have to be relentless. I would like to think that, you know, I have this wisdom that I've like knew all these things or have known all these things or like you're that kind of person. Um, that's not really true though. I mean, it's, I think this whole thing is just a matter of kind of committing to growth, committing to learning, committing to being on this, on this path um, and risking what you have, like putting yourself out there, putting your reputation at stake. Um, it is, you know, one of the common things about most startups is they are inherently public vehicles. And if you crash and burn, you're, you're picking a very public stage on, on which to, on which to fail in front of, in front of a, a you know, live studio audience. Um, that's, that's really hard. Um, and even like on a daily basis, you know, you'll experience the highs and lows of that. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's really hard, you know, not, not to, I mean, you, you, you have to go with that. Like you're, you're on this roller coaster and you're just, you don't know exactly where it's going and you're just hanging on for dear life. Uh, you know, <laughs> try to, try to keep the fun machine going. Um, so, yeah. So you just like, like really you just, you just have to be relentless. You just can't give up. You just have to keep going. Um, you have to follow your your own voice about what's what's right and because you're going to get a lot of conflicting information you're going to get a lot of wisdom that feels backwards um one of the metaphors that we use that I actually really like and I, I didn't invent it it came from village um but it's the metaphor of the two surfers and so i'll just leave you with this but so you've got two surfers and the one surfer, and they're equal in ability, right? You've got two surfers, but one of them is on the beach 
and one of them is out in the water. And so the, the, the bro on the beach, um, well, they've got this amazing vantage point, right? And they can see, well, I'd ride that wave and I'd take it that way and I'd ride that wave and that would be awesome, right? And kind of all that wisdom though, it profits them nothing because by being on the beach and not risking anything, you actually have zero chance of ever riding a wave. Um, you compare that to the surfer who's actually in the water. So you are dealing with, like, first of all, your perspective is limited. All you can see is like really what's right in front of you and around you, right? You're just trying to deal with those local conditions. You're trying to not drown. You're trying to not lose your bathing suit in front of like all the chicks, right? You're, you're trying not to embarrass yourself. Um, but you're putting yourself out there. You're putting yourself at risk. And you are actually in the only position to catch the wave. Um, so you just have to keep putting yourself out there. Um, if this is really what you want to do, if you want to, if you, if you do really want to be an entrepreneur, if you do really want to be that kind of creator, like you kind of just pursue that idea and the opportunity will eventually come to you. Um, you know, what was it? It's like the, uh, Ben and Jerry's, like, they were originally going to do like a donut shop or something. And then they like did the math and realized they like didn't want to do that. And so they did ice cream instead, but they like, but they had this idea that they wanted to work together. They wanted to do some kind of like snacky food and like, and they waited for the, op for the opportunity to, to come to them. They waited for their wave. Um, so, so yeah. And there's, it's always a good time to do that. Even during the pandemic is a good time to do it. Um, even if you're in a relatively safe job, um, that's okay. You can always push on something else. Um, if, if that's really, you know, the kind of journey that you want to be on, um, I think it's ultimately very rewarding and, and worth it. Um, and I think you'll find plenty of people that will will want to join you on that and, and help you along. Hmm. Wow! Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this was this was um, I think this will be an amazing podcast. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. This is this is really fun. All right, <laughs> thank you. And have a great weekend. You too. Take care. All right. Hey, thanks a lot for staying until the end. We really appreciate that. If you liked the episode, please let us know in the comments or you can leave a like. You can even just follow us and check out our other episodes. If you'd like to talk more with us, the guests or other people who are following the podcast, please consider taking a look at our Discord. We try to have weekly discussions. We try to stay behind each other's projects. It's a very good place to share information and it's a really good growth environment. So thanks again and until the next one, have a good time.